I have a message that I'm going to get to, but before I get to the message that God put on my heart, I need to say something. How many people have ever heard that phrase, the finished work of Christ? Nobody? Three of you, okay. The finished work of Christ. We just participated in communion. Communion is a celebration that the the work of Christ is finished. How many people know he's not suffering anymore? How many people know that he died once and for all, for all time? Hallelujah. If you blow it this week, Matt, he doesn't have to go back to the cross. His blood is still alive. It's still working. It still cleanses our sins. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. It's a finished work of Christ. Hallelujah. His death, burial, and resurrection put a put a, a nail on the coffin of your sin, a nail on the coffin of your backsliding. It's it is done, amen. Hallelujah. And I'm about ready to say something, but there also got to be a point in your life where you understand that there's a finished work of Ralph. Do you know that there's a finished work of George? Do you know that there's a finished work of Jeff, Barb? Do you know that there's a finished work of Bob? And you know, we, need to, we need to get done with this playing around with Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow God. I'm not going to follow God. I'm going to follow God. Oh, maybe not this day. There's got to be a finished work of Ralph where I understand that it's based on the finished work of Christ. He paid it all and, and he, he, he bled. He can't suffer anymore for my sins. And I internalize that and I say yes to Jesus. I am going to follow God. I'm not saying I'll never struggle. I'm not saying I won't even fail sometimes. But there's something in my spirit that's finished. I'm going to live for Jesus. Can you say amen? It says in Titus chapter 2, it says that the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires. Hallelujah. But to live righteously and holy in this present age. That this day there could be not only the finished work of Christ, there is the finished work of Ralph. Hallelujah. He did it. He paid a he paid a a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And that's finished. But so is a decision of whether I'm gonna follow Jesus, whether I'm gonna serve Jesus, whether I'm gonna go the distance for Jesus. Can you say amen? Everybody say it is finished. It's very interesting that verse in Titus goes really into my message because after it says um, that by the, the grace of God, we say no to our sins and yes to righteousness. It says that Jesus came to purify himself of people that are zealous for good works. Everybody say zealous. Another translation says earnest for good deeds, zealous for good works, earnest for good deeds, that there's a spirit within the believer that says, I want to serve God. And there comes my title. The title of the message is Serving God, Doing Good, and Loving Others. Let's pray. Father, we just ask as we look into your word that you would teach us. Open up our eyes and heart. In Jesus' name. Got a few questions to ask you. How important is it to help the needy? To do good deeds and to love others. How important is it? You know, if you ask me my simple philosophy of this church, I can tell you without a blink of an eye to love God and love others. You know what the goal of your life is? Should be to love God and love others. Is Lisa okay? Did she have a stroke? They still don't know. Let's, oh, yes and no. Everybody put your hands. Father, we just pray for Lisa who's in the hospital still, Lord. And we just ask, God, that you would heal her completely, God. And Father, we just pray for her family that you would just be with them. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... Sorry about that. That's what we do as pastors. Okay. Um, So these are some questions. Do you know, this is powerful, do you know that Jesus taught, how many people want to know what Jesus taught? 
Do you know that Jesus taught that all history will culminate with the recognition of how people have helped others or how they have chosen not to extend a helping hand? That the culmination of history is good. You know what's going to happen at the end of history, at the end of time? Is that there is going to be a telling, not a foretelling, but a showing of who helped and who chose not to help. Do you know it goes further when you study the scriptures that that your history, your history will culminate in the recognition of how you have helped other people or how you have chosen not to help other people? How many people know that there's going to come a day, Pete, where you're going to be standing before a throne, and on that throne is going to be a mighty God? Hallelujah, mighty, mighty, big God. Hallelujah. On that, and on that day, you're not going to be there with any excuses. You're going to be there humbly before the mighty throne of God. And at one of the thrones of God that we're going to stand before, Jesus is going to, something like this is going to happen as Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 25. Now listen. It says, all nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right side and the goats on his left. It will be the end of history as we know it. And the king will say to those on the right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And he'll be very specific. And this is what he says. For I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. And you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. I needed clothes. And you clothed me. I was sick. And you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous are going to answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needy and clothe you? When? When did, you, when did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Just let that sink in. That's the culmination of history. What are you working for in your life? What are you sweating for? What, you know, how many, people have, uh, how many people have ever been to the track and, and you really did make a bet? What are you betting on in your life? What, you know, in life, we, we make bets all the time, okay? And I'm not talking about at the track. We, we bet on things. Well, I'm going to put my time and energy. How many people have put their time and energy in college? It's good to see you, bro. You put your time and energy in college because you hope it's going to pay off, right? How many people have put their time and energy in certain relationships? But when you do that, you're hoping that it's going to pay off. It's going to bring back dividends of love and compassion. Is anybody listening to me in this house? Let me tell you something. Jesus is saying here, I want you to put your money on showing love, doing acts of kindness, and doing good things. Amen. Because there will be a day that we will stand before God. And he's not going to ask us about our checkbooks, so to speak. And he's not going to ask us how, if we mowed our lawn every week. He's not going to even ask us if we got rid of the McDonald packages in the back of our car. You could have cleaned your car before the rapture. I left it for the devil. That will be my answer. <laughs> for real. But he's going to ask me if I loved. Jesus, it's very interesting. One time he was hanging out with a bunch of folks, and there was a lawyer who thought he was all that and a bag of chips. And this lawyer stood up. It says, it says that to put Jesus to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You think you're so smart. Isn't that a good question, Jesus? You tell me. 
And Jesus, and, and Jesus said to him back, what is written in the law? How, how does the Bible read, basically? What does the Bible say? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, thinking he was cool, but who is my neighbor? We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, but who's my neighbor? Let me ask this question. Who here knows we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves? Who here knows who your neighbor is? We'll find out. Jesus goes on and t- when he says, who's my neighbor? Jesus tells him, continues to tell a story in verse 30, the next verse. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, if you study Jerusalem from Jericho, it's about 17 miles. But in that 17 miles, it drops about 3,000 feet. That's like a mountain. It drops 3,000 feet, and there's all these places for crooks and robbers to hide. And it was a very dangerous, precarious road, okay? And this man was going on a journey from Jerusalem to Judea. And it says, while he was going down, he fell among robbers. And they stripped him, beat him, and he went, and went away, leaving him half dead. Everybody say, that's not happy. What do we know about this man who was robbed? who was attacked by these robbers. We do not know his name, his city, or his occupation. For all practical purpose, that man who was robbed was, and put those words up there, was a needless, faceless inconvenience. Was a needy, faceless inconvenience. Isn't that horrible to think about any human being as a needy, faceless inconvenience? What? That's exactly right. But how many people do we treat like they're just nothing more than a needy, faceless inconvenience? I don't know. That's horrible, though. All we know about that this man was that he had a misfortune on his journey. He fell among robbers. He was stripped. He was beaten. And he was left half dead. How many people would agree that that's not happy? The next verse says, and by chance, a priest. Now, who were the priests in this story? The priests were those who worshiped God, right? These were people who were supposed to be holy, who were supposed to live for God. These were people that knew what the commandment said, that knew about the heart of God. Am I right or am I right? I'm right, exactly. Thank you. The priest came, and he was going down on that road, and when he saw that man lying there, he passed by on the other side. The very next verse says, likewise, a Levite. The Levites were also priests, but they were not those who could be high priests. They were more like the servant priests. And also, when he came to the place, he saw him, and he also passed by on the other side. It's interesting, because when you read it in English, uh, um, it sounds like the Levite and the priest had the same reaction, doesn't it? They both saw him, and they passed on the other side. But the Greek brings out another flavor. You see, when it says the Levite saw him, it uses a different Greek word. And it means he really looked at him. So the priest, when he saw him, he said, I don't want to see him. I don't see him. I don't see him. I don't see him. I got a job to do. I got things to do. Places to go. I'm late. I'm late for a very important day. I have no time to help anybody. I'm God. No, no, I don't see that person. That's what the priest did. He just kept going. He immediately, he, he was, the priest trained himself not to look. Everybody said, that's bad. that's bad. Now, the Levite didn't train himself to have a hard heart. He just had one. He actually looked. And he, it, the Greek word, he, re, he, he, it's like he paid attention. He saw that man's need. But then he walked away. Everybody say, that's also bad. What didn't they know? How could they walk away? What did not they know that allowed them, a priest and a Levite, two holy men from God? What what didn't they have in their heart that would allow them to walk away? Absolutely.
Do you think that for one moment, for one moment, that when they looked at that man, they said to themselves, God loves that person? In their need, in their hurt, in their pain, God loves that person. I don't think they had it in their heart that any love that they would show that man would be shown to their heavenly father. I don't think that they know that any love that they withheld from that man would be withheld from their heavenly father. What weren't they thinking about in relationship to Matthew chapter 25 that we read in the beginning of this message? How we're all going to stand before the holy God and he's going to say that I was sick and you visited me. I was on that road of Samaria and you reached down and helped. Everybody say, thank God there's a but sometimes. Seriously. The next verse says, but a Samaritan. The Samaritans were thought of as ungodly people that didn't know God. Sometimes God's got to use those who we think don't know God. It says, but a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. That Greek word is a very long Greek word. It means to be moved with when one's inner part. To have deep feelings of empathy and pity and to reach out. But to reach out based on what's going on on the inside. He felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds. And he poured oil and wine on them. And he put them on his own beast. It means he started to walk down those steep hills. And he brought him to an inn and took care of him. Give the Samaritan a, a, a big round of applause. <laughs> Say a little prayer that God would teach you to be like that Samaritan. And then he didn't stop there. On the next day, he took out two denarii. That's two full day's worth of wages. And he gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. You see, the Samaritan lived by the golden rule. He saw a need, he met a need. He saw a need, he met a need. Want to know the simple philosophy? See a need, meet a need. See a need? You didn't get it. He lived by a simple philosophy. He saw a need. He met a need. Want to know the simple philosophy? He saw a need. He saw a need. He saw a need. He saw a need. Okay. He loved God. And because he loved God, he loved others. And he will receive a reward many in heaven. Who here wants to be like the Good Samaritan? Jesus brings the story back to the original question and the second commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 36, which is the next verse. He says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to a man who fell into the robber's hands? You know, you might think, how many people, have, how many people here listen to the news sometimes? The talking heads. You know, and yeah, some of the things that they say, are, you know, they, they just, they, they miss the, sometimes the whole the whole thing. But if you, you study this little parable, there were literally six people that, that you would think were part of the story. The robbers, the traveler, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, and the innkeeper. But Jesus says, you know, you know, the robbers, see, we think that the problems are the robbers. If we could just stop the robbers from robbering, then there won't be any hurting people and the whole world will be better. Right? We got to just lock up those robbers and everything will be fine, okay? Um, but Jesus, he says, he says, there's only really three important people in this story. You know, it's not the, even the innkeeper. You know, was he going to keep his word? How many people, you give the innkeeper two extra days of wages and how many people are worried that he's not going to pilfer them, kick the guy out and said he spent the two days wages? Don't even worry about that. All the stuff we worry about. There are th Three people in this story you need to think about. You need to think about the Levite, the priest, and the Samaritan. And you need to ask yourself question. 
Which one fulfilled the commandment of God? Which one? The Samaritan. How many people like when somebody, I like Jesus testing me because he asks me questions that I know the answer. Okay? Okay. Which one? Okay? And, and, and he said, which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy towards him. Then Jesus said this, plain and simple. Hallelujah. Go do likewise. You want to know what God is saying to you today? Go do likewise. Do likewise what? Just like how Jesus lived his whole life. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to serve and to be a servant for many. Can you say amen? And so go do likewise. Reach out in the love of God, in the love of Christ. Have mercy on people. Have kindness on people. Everybody say, I need to see them. I need to look upon them and not turn away like the Levite. Hallelujah. This is a progression. The first one looked and didn't see, um, didn't allow himself to see. The second one looked, felt bad, but left anyway. But the third one figured out a way to bring help and healing. One of my wife's prayers, and I do think that she's somewhat insane for praying this, but one of her prayers that she's prayed for years is, Lord, let my um, today... Let me be inconvenienced for your kingdom's sake. Today, give me an opportunity to be inconvenienced. Today, and I always like to say that my comfort zone needs to be in my rear view mirror. Your comfort zone should be in your rear view mirror. Today, give me an opportunity to be inconvenienced for the kingdom of God today. You know, we do a lot of things in this church because we want to be true to our heart conviction that we want to love God and love people. And so, and there's some pictures. I don't know which ones you have and which ones you don't. But throw a picture of last weekend or two weekends ago, a, a bunch of men and women. Irv, remember that day? That's right. We went and they built a ramp for a, a family that didn't have a ramp. Okay, we didn't charge anything. They just built that ramp. Hallelujah. Last year, we built a ramp for another family. We do those things. You'll find them in the bulletin. We call them Servant Fest or Hands and Feet. And these are ministry where we're reaching out in compassion to love one another. Put some pictures about the food pantry up there. Um, once a month, every month, we feed about 500 plus people. And, um, and all free of charge. And um, it's part of the vision of this church is to minister grace and show compassion to those who have need. Let me just say this too. We want you to know this. If you're ever in need, it's the third Saturday every month. We don't embarrass people. We just want to help people. Everybody say that's a good thing. Hallelujah. If you know somebody that's, that's not from this church that, that needs help, we don't care where they come from. Most people don't go to our church. We want the people in our church to know there's help for them. We, we want to help people and love Jesus. Can you say amen? So we want you to be. And throughout the year, you'll see um, next week, Jim was talking about the, the, the shoe boxes for Christ. Annette, will you stand up? Now, Annette started this ministry here in our church how many years ago? About see, I, We're not that old. <laughs> I must have been three years old when we started that. You must have been two and a half. But Annette, um, over those 16 years, can you even guess how many boxes we send around the world? Oh, you have it now. Next week we'll have that, okay? But in the back, if you have any questions, but it's so beautiful. In, in two Sundays, this whole place will be filled. Renette, isn't that true? The boxes, they usually fill the whole thing, just, and it's just beautiful. All presents for kids around the world, going to some of the neediest of the needy around the world. And then a few weeks after that, one of the things we do is we get um, Dyfus kids' names. We get about 150 names, and um, we give presents to them. It's really cool. Um, we're one of the churches that really reaches, these are kids that are stuck in the middle of the system and they don't get any presents. And, and, and we have information in the back. You could pick the name, the age of a, of a child and you could put a, so, uh, 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 some Christian literature in there. And, you just, and it's just a powerful way to minister. But the key to this story, and I want you to get involved in all the things the church does to reach the world for God. But the, the moral of this story is that a sovereign God sees you and he will put in your path 
opportunities for you to serve. And you need to see. So the question is, are we going to be like the priest? Everybody say, ooh, that's bad. Or the Levite? Say, that's not good. Or the Samaritan? And Jesus simply said, you go and do likewise.